Hallelujah. I had this on tonight because I want to begin by talking about reaching out and touching the hem of the garment. The brother gave his powerful testimony. He talked about in reaching out and touching God and touching, as it were, the hem of the garment even through the prayer cloth. And tonight I want to tell you a little bit about the prayer shawl that I'm wearing just for a moment or two. And it's called a tallit. And for the origin of the, of the tallit, I want to read you a few scriptures briefly in Numbers, the 15th chapter, and verse 37 through 40. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they should make them, they should make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And this is the reason why. It shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and not only remember them, but do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you, I like this, it says, it used to go, you used to go a-whoring. You used to, but not anymore. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. For I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. And just to make it a little more emphatic, he said again, I am the Lord your God. And so he told them that they were to have this prayer shawl, this tallit, and they, they were to put the fringes on the corners. And without getting real technical, uh, let me just say that there were three things that this could stand for. First of all, because of the way that they would tie the knots and the loops and the fringes, it would give them a numerical value. And it stood for the whole word of God, all of the commandments, most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments, but how many know there were a whole lot more than that? And they were required to know them, remember them, and do them. Most importantly, to do them. And so he told them, if you will take these fringes and you will, when you go to prayer, you put your prayer shawl on and so you won't forget any of the commandments as you're praying, you can remember the commandments of the Lord. And as you begin to pray these things and how many know that praying the word of God is scriptural? Because when you pray the word of God, you're not praying some dead letter that a man wrote and you're not praying something out of your own intellect. Because sometimes when we pray out of our own intellect, we pray everything all wrong and backwards. And we're worse off when we finish than when we started to pray. But when we pray the word of God, we'll never go wrong because God's word is alive. And so he wanted them to remember the whole word of God because contained in the word of God is life and health and healing and blessings and everything you'll ever need. And so he told them, this will help you to remember. Some people believe that's, that's why today some people tie a string around their finger. 
And you say, why do you have that tied around your finger like that? And you say, that's so I remember I've got to go to the cleaners and pick up my clothes. If I don't pick them up, I'll have nothing to wear to work tomorrow. I got to remember to do that. That's why that string is tied around my finger. Well, it came from this. Remembering the word of God. Amen. And so there was a purpose in it. And the purpose was so that they would always remember God's word. So the number one purpose was they'd remember the whole word of God. As I said, it was a prayer shawl. So they would take the prayer shawl when they would go to put it on. And I'm not going to take it off and put it on again because I might lose my microphone. But they would first inspect the fringes and make sure that they were not frayed in any way. And they would lovingly inspect it. And then they would speak a blessing as they carefully and respectfully put the prayer shawl on and they would begin by putting it over their head so as to demonstrate that they were coming under the covering and the protection of Almighty God. And so they were in their own little private prayer closet when they first put it over their head. And they would say, Baruch HaTah Adonai Lohenu Malaka Olam. And then they would recite this real long prayer, I'm not even going to try. Okay, the, the part that I just recited is the first part of every Hebrew blessing and prayer, regardless of whether they're praying over their food, if they're praying over their children, if they're praying over their house, it doesn't matter what they're praying for, and they have blessings for everything. If I told you some of the things that they have blessings for, you'd say, oh, oh no. So I'm not even going to tell you because you wouldn't believe me. But they all start off with Baruch Hata Adonai Lehenu Melaka Olam. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. And then they would have a specific prayer for whatever it is they're praying for. I think it's kind of wild that you have a prayer to pray for your prayer shawl. I mean, God overdoes everything he does. He's radical. Everything that God does, he does it to the extreme. And that's why I'm not ashamed to be radical and extreme. When God wants you to pray over your prayer shawl before you pray, tells me God thinks prayer is mighty important. And he wants us to come in the right attitude. There's no point in coming if I'm not going to get what I came for. So I have to come in the right attitude. Respecting in the word of God and knowing this word is alive. And if I will believe it, I will get what it says. And so they came knowing that. Now, in addition to knowing that it stood for the whole word of God, secondly, it stood for the name of God. Because every Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. Every Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. Therefore, if you know how to spell a word in Hebrew, you know what the numerical value of that word is. And so that means that the name of God, the sacred name, which is Jehovah, which in Hebrew is just what we would, we, it's yud hey vav hey because it, you have to put the vowel sounds in, it's not written out. And so that's the sacred name of God that in your King James Bible is always in there as capital L-O-R-D. When you see capital L-O-R-D, Lord, it's the same thing as Jehovah, but not wanting to make the name of God so common that they just, you know, said it and said it and said it. They didn't want to make it common, so they didn't even use it. They put Lord in in its place. So it's different than lowercase, capital L, lowercase, O-R-D, Lord, which is Adonai. But the sacred name of Jehovah, well, there was numbers on here for them to spell out the name of God, his sacred name. And everything that God has deposited, he has deposited in his word, and we can receive it through his name. The third thing that, that a prayer shawl could do, and this is more on the individual owner of the prayer shawl, was it showed their authority. Now, we know that God's name is his authority. Amen? Amen. And it's through the name of Jesus that we receive everything that we do receive. But now, I want to let you know that in the time of Jesus Christ, the individual rabbi or Jewish man would actually have his own family name 
in the knots and loops depended on the numerical value of his name. It would be in the, in the knots and the loops, so it would spell out his name. That meant when he went to make a, um, he went to the grocery store or the carpenter shop or wherever he went and he was going to uh, purchase something, then he could take, or he was coming and making a, a, a contract or an agreement with someone, he could take that fringe that had the knots and the loops in such a way that it spelled his family name and pressed it into fresh clay. And there he had, just like you take your credit card and swipe it when you go to the store. When you make a transaction, you get your debit card out and you swipe it and you sign your name, and it's a legal contract. You agree to whatever it was. Well, they could take the fringe on their tallit and press it into fresh clay, and it was the same as putting their seal or their signature on the document, and that they were in agreement with that. Now, let's just give you a couple quick illustrations of this. Now, for instance, let's look in the, in the Bible days what uh, some of the examples in the Word of God specifically at this point in the Old Testament of the tallit, because you're not going to see the word tallit in there. It, it's going to be obscure in, in the English Bible. It's going to be like garment and robe, and uh, you're not even going to see prayer shawl. You're going to see garment and robe. Sometimes you're going to see napkin. It's going to be just ordinary words, and you're not going to realize it's referring to the prayer shawl. One word that is a little unusual that might make you sort of suspect it's a prayer shawl, is the word mantle. Amen? How many are getting? No, we're getting warm now. So we find out that it means, let's look at the, the fact that it meant authority. The best illustration, I believe, for this is when King David, well, he wasn't king yet, King Saul was jealous of David and was trying to kill him. Without going into the whole story, how many are now on the same page with me? You all know, of course, that he tried 21 times to get rid of him because he was jealous of him because he knew that God had his hand upon him and he was going to surely take over the kingdom. But at this point, Saul was still the king. Now, David had to run for his life. He was hiding in a cave with his men. He had about 600 men that hung out with him, and they were all the lowlifers, the rabble, the, you know, the ones nobody else wanted. But David took them and made mighty men out of them, and here they're in the cave. And wouldn't you know, David's good, great luck. While they're in the cave, who else decides to come into that same cave? And now we're talking about huge caves that go on and on. Okay, so that a lot of people could be in there and not know other people are in there. Who should come in that cave but King Saul himself? The Bible says he went in the cave because he needed to go to the bathroom. That's what the Bible says. So he went in the cave, and while he was there, he decided to take a nap. And so it was, they laid down and they fell asleep. And here David comes and his men and his men said, Oh, David, how blessed you are of God. God brought your enemy right to you. Now slay him. Right now, you got your golden opportunity. Now, how many know a lot of people would say, that is a word from the Lord? <laughs> Wouldn't they? <laughs> a lot of people today, that's exactly what they'd say. It must be God. He brought him right to me. I'm supposed to kill him and get rid of him so I can ascend to the throne. But David didn't have any of that in his heart. He didn't wish Saul dead. He just wanted Saul to... You know, stop chasing him around. He says, you're hunting me like an animal. So David, he had no intention of killing Saul, but he thought, I've got to show Saul my heart is in the right place. I've got you right there. If I want to kill you like you're spreading lies all over Israel, got people hunt me down because they think I'm trying to kill you. If this is my chance if I want to kill you. And the Bible says he took his sword and he cut off the corner of Saul's skirt. And then the next morning, when, there, when Saul got up and his men got up, David was up high on the on a, up on a upper place and he called down and he said, Saul, look what I had. I had my chance to kill you and I didn't. And this is what Saul said. Saul said, now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Why? Why did Saul know that? Just because he cut off his skirt. He cut off the fringes 
of his prayer shawl that was his authority, that said, I am King Saul, that said, I am the king of Israel. And when he cut it off, it was a metaphor that even a backslidden king like Saul could get, that God was saying, your days are numbered. And just like he cut that off of your authority off, he cut it off and I put it in his hands. So it meant someone's authority. And this is important for you to remember that it means if the fringe meant the authority. In fact, David all of a sudden got chicken hearted. The Bible said it smote him in his heart because he did that. Now we would say, what's the big deal? You could have killed him and you didn't. So who cares about the, the, the corner of his skirt? No, 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 no. It wasn't just the corner of his skirt. It was the symbol of his authority as king. And all of a sudden, David's heart smote him, and he said, I will not touch God's anointed. Even though he's not right and he's not doing right, it's not for me. It's for God to move him out and move me in, not me. And so the reason why he got under conviction was because he had touched the authority of the king. So how many see that? Now, I mentioned, mentioned a moment ago about the mantle. Who had the mantle in the Bible? Elijah had the mantle. And that's not just, you know, like a woman's shawl that we wear when we go out at night and we're cold and we got a little shawl on and we go in the air conditioning. No, it was talking about the tallit. It was talking about his prayer shawl. It was, the, it was his authority. It was his ministry because when God was preparing to take Elijah up, he gave him three instructions. He said, I want you to go and anoint Haziel as king of Syria, anoint Jehu as king of Israel, and anoint Elisha as prophet in your place because I'm getting ready to call you home and I want you to have the protege already in place. So Elijah obeyed the word of God. And this is how the Bible tells us he did it. He was walking along and he saw Elisha out in the field because he was, he was a rich man from a rich family. They had 12 set of oxen and that means they were rich. They were plowing the field and Elisha was with the, with the 12th one. And here came Elijah and the Bible says he threw his mantle on him. But he threw his prayer shawl on him, his tallit on him, and went, oh my God, when that great man of God came by and put that mantle on Elisha, Elisha knew it was his time. Hallelujah. He knew it was his time. Amen. Oh, so let me, I want you to see. Now, the thing about Elisha, Elijah, I should say, and then Elisha, let's just throw this in. The tallits were made of linen and wool. But the Bible says that Elijah had one made of camel's hair. Isn't that what the Bible says he wore? Camel's hair. And why that is so unusual and that why should even, we should even pay attention to it as though it would be significant is because, now this is not in the Bible, but the Jewish scholars teach that that same camel's hair tallit that he passed down to Elisha that, you know, there was a school of prophets. How many know that? They, there was a bunch of prophets. We don't know all their names. There was a whole bunch of them. They all lived together in the same place, the school of prophets. And Elisha was part of that. And the, and the Jewish scholars teach that that tallit of that camel haired tallit prayer shawl of Elijah's and Elisha's, you know, the one that they struck the Jordan River and it rolled back, that one that camel hair one, that it was passed down to the prophets. And they kept it for generation after generation until they passed it down to Zacharias. You know who he was. He was the father of John the Baptist. And before John the Baptist was, was born, Zacharias prophesied and he said that he would have a son who would be a great prophet who would come in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And guess what the Bible says John the Baptist wore? You got it. Camel's hair. And in that same Jordan River that Elijah and Elisha struck it and it opened up, 
John the Baptist in the power and spirit of Elijah baptized the Messiah and said, he's the one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I want you to see the significance of this prayer shawl. It's important that we understand this. Amen? Uh, a couple other things. Let me just give you a couple more in the Old Testament. We'll move in the New Testament and then we'll, we'll stay there. Now, how many know the, the wicked uh, prophet Balaam was hired by Balak to curse the children of Israel when they came into the land and he didn't want them trespassing on his territory. He didn't want anything to do with them and so he thought, I want them cursed. And he heard of Balaam, and so he called him. Now the word Balaam, the name Balaam itself means to speak evil of people. That's the literal meaning of the word. I don't know what was wrong with his mother. <laughs> I don't know. But she called him that, and I guess, you know, that was his name. And so Balak said, that's the one I need, because I need somebody to curse these people for me. And you know the story, how that, you know, he couldn't curse them and even the donkey talked and, you know, he was trying to get that money and every time he tried to curse them, what did he do? I bless you. Amen. Amen. And so after all of these tries and Balak is getting so frustrated, he says, look, let's go up here on this Mount Pisgah where we can get a really good look at these people. I want you to look down then because you see the idea of cursing is to cast down. Even blessing is to Bless, you cast, you know, you know, not to, to refer to anything in witchcraft or anything, but they cast a spell because they do it from above down. So he says, come up here on this mountain and look at these people and curse them for me. But when he got up there, he saw a beautiful sight. And he began to prophesy up there in that mountain. And he began to say, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Because he not only saw the encampment of the children of Israel, and I told you this once before, so I'll throw it in, that because God had told them specifically where each tribe was to go, whether it was east, west, north, south, around the tabernacle, which was in the middle, not every tribe was the same size. Manasseh was like the largest. I forgot now which one was the smallest. It might have been Benjamin. But when they were put in the place where God told them, if you got up on the mountain and you looked down, you saw the cross. And so he saw all these beautiful tents in the shape of a cross. And the Hebrew word for cross, they didn't have a word cross back then. Nobody uh, knew about uh, crosses or crucifixions. But the last word of the Hebrew alphabet is tau, which for, the sign for it is a cross. And it means a sign. Because every Hebrew word has a meaning. And the word for tau, which would be equivalent to our English Z, which would be equivalent to the Greek Omega, but the Hebrew tau means cross, and it means a sign. So when he looked down there, he saw the camp in the form of a cross, and it was a sign. But not only that, he saw all those precious Jewish men, and there they stood in the door of their tent, and they were praying with their prayer shawls on and they were speaking the word of God and they were rehearsing the commandments of God. And so he said, there's no, he be, tried to curse them and all he could do was bless them and bless them and bless them. Amen. All right. One more Old Testament one. It's really good. It's on the last, last page of the Old Testament in Malachi, the last prophet in the chapter four, verse two. And you all know this one. And the son, to them that fear his name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. But that Hebrew word wings is the same word for fringes. The same word for tassels or fringes. So it can be translated, and the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his fringes, in his prayer shawl. Now, was that a pro prophecy or not? Was that a prophetic word or not? Do you know anybody? Have you heard of anybody that came and fulfilled that prophecy? Who had healing in their fringes? Who had healing in his prayer shawl? 
I do. Amen. And I find out that if you even were to fast forward into the New Testament, you'll find out if you go to the last book of the New Testament, Revelation, you'll read in the 19th chapter about the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And it says he's riding on a white horse and he has a garment. But remember what I told you about that word garment. It may not just mean a, a garment garment. He has a garment that is dipped in blood. And he has on the garment on his thigh because the prayer shawl, where does it hang down to? To the thigh. The fringes hit you right in the thigh. And the fringes are spelling out his name. It says he's the word of God and the Lord of lords and the king of kings. So the authority of his name was in the fringes of his prayer shawl and the whole word of God because he was the word of God made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And it was represented in his prayer shawl. How many know that's pretty wild? Amen? Now how many know we can really use that information? We can really go somewhere with that. So why don't we go to Mark, the fifth chapter, one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. It's got to be one of the most exciting chapters in the Gospels. I tell you, from the, from the opening word to the closing word, it's nothing but action, action, action. The Holy Ghost in action through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we'll start in Mark. There's a lot of good things in there, but we'll just go to the middle and we'll start in Mark, the fifth chapter, and verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. He had just came back from delivering legion. That's in the beginning of the chapter. And now he's going back to the other side, because remember, he left specifically to deliver legion, and now he's going back where all the people were. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now, first of all, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. He probably was like a worship leader. They would have, depending on the size of the synagogue, they would have one or more rulers in the synagogue. So he wasn't a priest. How many understand? He was a ruler. And so he, he came to Jesus and he fell at Jesus' feet. Now, this signifies someone who is desperate. This is someone who's serious. This is someone who's coming and making a serious, earnest, desperate petition. Amen? And he came and he fell at Jesus' feet. It also shows humility. He was the ruler of the synagogue. And most of the people in the synagogue didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. They were the ones trying to get rid of him. All the rulers, all the scribes and the priests and the Pharisees. Amen? But he showed his humility and he came and he fell at the feet of Jesus because he recognized something. He knew that he was a ruler. He knew that he was a minister. He knew that he had a title behind his name. I don't know if he had a, a PhD, if he was a doctor or any of that, but he knew that he was a ruler, but he bowed down. He fell at Jesus' feet because he understood he was the lesser and Jesus was the greater. Amen? And the lesser always bows down to the greater. Amen? So he bowed down at Jesus' feet, and he besought him. Now this is a word we don't use very much, but it's a very strong word when you beseech. You are begging with everything that you have. There is nothing that you will not do to get this petition. 
This is the most important thing in his life. He besought Jesus. He bowed down in humility. And he besought him saying, my little daughter. He wasn't just saying that to give Jesus an indication of how old she was. He didn't mean little, even though we know she was 12 years old, we find that out. That was not what he was saying. When he used the word, my little daughter, he wasn't talking about her age. He was using a word of endearment. He was using a word of, of affection. He was saying, my precious little daughter, the one who's the apple of my eye, the one that in the morning, her smile fills my heart with joy. The one that I can't wait to get home from the synagogue so that I can play with my little daughter. The little one that brings joy to my heart. My little daughter is lying at the point of death. These are very strong words in the Greek. It means she's in the last stages. He needed a miracle. He was desperate. Amen? And so he said, come home with me. Come to my house and lay hands on my little daughter. And what? She shall live. You see, he had faith. He believed. He said, I believe that if you touch her, if you lay hands on her, she shall live. And what I want to tell you about tonight in this story is the four P's of perfect faith. The first P is you've got to petition. And you've got to be earnest. And you've got to be sincere. And you've got to be desperate. And you've got to believe that Jesus can give you what you need. He said, I believe if you just come to my house, I know she's dying. But if you lay hands on her, she shall live. Amen? So the first P of faith is petition. And we find out that Jesus granted his request. Unlike a lot of people today that, frankly, they would have to ch check their calendar. Check their day calendar and see if they can fit you in. See if they got time. You know, they're too busy. I can't come to you. You come to me. I'm the man of God. You come to me. But Jesus said, all right, I'll come. Because he saw that he was desperate. He said, this is my little girl. And she's in the last stages. But if you touch her, she shall live. So let's see what happens. Where we leave off at. Verse 25. So verse 24, we, he followed them. And guess what? Much people followed him and what? Thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. I tell you, it's depressing to even read this. Because everything is spoken in the ultimate negative. She had been sick and suffered for many years and had many physicians and they had done many things, tried many things, spent all her money, and she was worse. Amen? She'd suffered many things and they didn't help her, but rather they made her worse. So when she had heard of Jesus. She came in the press behind and touched his garment. Remember what I told you about garment now? And touched his garment, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. I think I've heard something like this before. I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague and Jesus immediately knowing himself that virtue had gone out of him turned him about in the press and said who touched my clothes and his disciples said unto him now you see the multitude thronging thee and you say who touched me 
And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now we have this interruption. We have a desperate situation where a little girl is at the point of death and time is of the essence. And Jesus, you must come quickly. You must come now. But the good news is I know that even though she's at the point of death, if you touch her, she shall be healed. He had faith. He believed that Jesus could heal her. But sometimes on your road to a miracle, you get interrupted. And here was an interruption of a woman who had been sick and suffering for 12 long years. Now we find out that the little girl, in fact, was 12 years old, so that I quickly do the math and I say, that means this woman has been suffering as long as this little girl has been living. And all this time, not only has she been suffering in her body and not getting any better physically, but I can tell you by experience that when you have done everything they tell you to do and you've taken everything they tell you to take, and, and you don't get better, but you get worse. The depression, the hopelessness that comes against you, the attack, the anxiety, the lies that Satan begins to bombard you with. Sometimes that mental anguish and emotional pain is worse. Amen? And she had suffered all of these things, and here she was, no better, sicker, and poorer too. And now no means, if somebody, if some new thing, a breakthrough came through. She didn't have the money. She didn't have any means. Amen? So here was this interruption of this petition. And they began to throng Jesus. And this little woman, she had heard. Because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing the word of God. She had heard about Jesus. I don't know exactly what she heard. I don't know what miracle had been told her. But just like this brother gave his testimony, and many people have heard it tonight, and many people in his nation have heard it, she had heard of the things that Jesus had done. She had heard that he was a miracle worker. She had heard that he had delivered people. He had opened the eyes of the blind. He had cleansed people with leprosy. And that was something that only the Messiah could do. Because there were three signs that the, the Jewish rabbis taught when the Messiah comes, he will do these things. And one of them was that he would heal people of leprosy because nobody could do it. Another was he would heal somebody who was blind from birth because Jesus was the light of the world. Now others had opened up blind eyes, but nobody that was blind from birth. That's why when Jesus healed that one man and they took him before the Pharisees and they kept saying over and over again, tell us the truth. How did you get healed? What did this man do to you? He said, I've already told you a couple times. You haven't listened. You haven't heard. You don't hear nothing I say. And they said, he said, don't you want to be his disciple? And they got incensed at that. They said, let me tell you something. We are Moses' disciples. You are nothing but a sinner. And that man, we don't even know who he is. And that blind, well, that previously blind man said, well, isn't that marvelous? You don't know who he is. And yet he opened up the eyes of someone who was blind from birth. Who ever heard of anyone doing that? I thought you were the ones that were supposed to be looking for the Messiah. And I'm a living witness. Here's one of the messianic signs. Amen? And the third messianic sign was that he would cast out the demons of someone who had a demon that caused him to be dumb or I should say mute, that he could not speak. Because we know that 
the Pharisees cast out demons. Because when they accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he said, well, first of all, Satan doesn't cast out Satan. And if I cast out demons by Satan, then who do your sons cast them out by? So we know that they cast out demons, but the thing of it is, according to the writings, when they cast out a demon, they said, what is your name? They had to have the demon speak. But if somebody's got a demon that won't let them talk, it's not going to help for you to ask them their name. So if that's the only way you know how to cast out devils is ask them your name and then say, okay, you demon such and such, come out. And you can't talk to that person. That demon won't let that person talk. You can't cast them out. But Jesus cast the demons out of the one that was deaf and mute, proving that he was the Messiah. And so we find that she had heard that Jesus was coming her way. And even though she was extremely weak, and we know she had to be terribly anemic, hemorrhaging all those many years, that was her daily lot in life. I can't imagine what a life that was to live. That meant she was, and, and you've got to understand, not only the physical suffering that that put on her body, but that ostracized her from society. Because a woman who had a... Uh, issue of blood that was active could not get around other people. They had so many laws and she had to go through so many things and wash all the clothes and wash all the sheets and wash the chair she sat on. She couldn't get anywhere near anybody. So she was totally ostracized and alone. Not only was she sick in her body, but she was alone. Now, I know most people, when they preach this, all of the time they say, that little widow woman. How many know you hear them say the little widow woman? Well, it doesn't say she's a widow. We just think that and we assume that and we all say the little widow woman. It doesn't say she was a widow. It doesn't say she was ever married because chances are she couldn't get married. Chances are she never had the privilege of being married because of her condition, because she was unclean. And for her to touch Jesus, what audacity! Because he was a rabbi. And for her to touch him, she would automatically make him unclean. You talk about faith. You talk about desperation. When you get desperate, when you get desperate, amen, you will start thinking, I'm not worrying about the consequences. I got an opportunity right now. Jesus may not be here some other time. He's coming now. I've got to make my move now. I've got to reach out now. Amen? So when she heard that Jesus was coming, even though she was weak, she was anemic from her blood loss, and she was ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, she had no other hope, she had no other resource, she had no other way, and she had already been working on her faith. And this is why I say this. Because she had heard about Jesus, so we know that faith had come by hearing. And she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his tallit, if I may but touch the hem of the fringes that represent the whole word of God. And the word of God says in Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. If I can just touch the authority of his name, if I can just touch the authority of who he is, because Malachi 4.2 said, and unto them that fear his name, that recognize and respect his authority, that know that he is the Messiah, that know that he is the Son of God, if I can touch his authority, I know that I shall be made whole. And 
and it says she said within herself, but the Greek tense is in the present tense. So it means, and she kept on saying, and she kept on saying, and she kept on saying. She didn't say it one time or two or three, but uh, she kept on saying, I know I can do this. Uh, I know if I touch him, I know if I can get close enough, all I've got to do is reach out and touch the fringe. Uh, I know that if I touch him, I'll be made whole. And because faith comes by hearing, even when it hears your own voice. That's why you got to open up your mouth and speak. Because faith is twofold. It's believing and it's speaking. Because we have the spirit of faith, we believe and we speak. It's not just enough to believe in your heart. The word of God says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you believe in your heart, but you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. You shall be healed. You shall be delivered or whatever you need from God. So she kept on saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Now, she said, I shall be made whole. J. Ryra said, if Jesus touches my little baby, my little girl, she shall live. She said, if I can touch Jesus, I'll be made whole. I, I don't know which way works for you. I don't know which way works for you. It doesn't matter whether Jesus touches you or you touch Jesus, you're going to be made whole. Amen? You've got to believe it either way. Don't put God in a box and say it's got to happen this way. I know how that goes. You know, it's when you get in rationale in your natural mind, you visualize the way you're going to get healed. And I'm going to go to this meeting and I'm going to sit on the front row on the end seat and they're going to sing this song, Rise and Be Healed in the Name of Jesus. And when that song comes, I'm going to jump up and I'm going to be healed. Now, if the Holy Ghost quickens that to you and that is what you believe, then that is what's going to happen. Amen. But you need to be prepared that whatever way he wants to do it, amen. Any way you want to heal me, Lord. Any way you want to bless me. Like Sister Hardy said, if you want to give me the Holy Ghost on the city bus. Amen. You've got to be willing. It doesn't mean that that's the only way it's going to happen, but you've got to expect it. Amen. So whatever way. So I'm asking you, what are you saying? See, she kept on saying I know I'll be healed. If I touch him, I'll be made whole. What are you saying? What is coming out of your mouth? Listen to what you're saying. Because if all you're doing is rehearsing over and over again, all the negative things that's been told you by the doctors, by people, all of the things that lying devil is sitting on your shoulder telling you, what your body is telling you, her body was telling her, you're too weak to do this. It's foolish for you. And anybody with rationale would agree, it's foolish in your condition to get out there in that mob of people and try to reach Jesus when it's going to mean that you're going to literally have to get down on your hands and knees to try to get close enough to him. You, you could very well get trampled on. That is so foolish for you to do that. How many ever heard that tone before? How many ever heard that argument before? How many know that's the voice of the flesh? That's the voice of the doubter and the unbeliever and the naysayer. Isn't that right? But she kept on saying over and over again. And the Bible says in Matthew, the same story in Matthew 9, 20 says, she touched the hem of his garment 
And that word means that she touched the tallit that represented the whole word of God. So in essence, what she was saying in a metaphor is when I take hold of the whole word of God, when I speak out of my mouth what I believe in my heart, that I have deposited in my spirit the whole word of God. Every verse that has anything that pertains to what I need from God, those are the verses that I live by. Every day I take my medicine. Every day I speak the word of God. I don't fail one day to do it. It doesn't matter what else I've got to do. I've got medicine out of God's word and every single day I take it just like clockwork, just like I open up those prescriptions that come from the pharmacy and take those things. I take the word of God because it said, if you will attend unto my word, and that, that means stay focused. Attend means give it your, your full attention. Stay focused on my word. If you will incline your ear unto my sayings, if you'll keep them before your eyes and let them not depart from the midst of your heart, they will be life to all your flesh and medicine to all your bones. And I tell God every day, your word is to me. Whatever I, it's an analgesic. It's an antihistamine. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's an antibiotic, an antiseptic, an antiparasitic, an anti-carcinogen, an anti-allergenic. It's whatever I need that's in this word. And immediately she felt something happened in her. She felt in her body that she was healed. And this was not just a spiritual feeling. She literally felt when that condition stopped. There, she knew that it stopped. And I'm sure that it came with a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. I'm sure she had a lot of abdominal pain. I'm sure she had a lot of inflammatory pain. And she realized you know, you don't have to have a thunderbolt hit you. You can just be praising God and worshiping God and all of a sudden you realize, huh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Amen. And she felt in her that she was healed. I want you to know that she heard, she said, she pressed, she touched, and she received. Amen. Amen. And every one of those was vital in her receiving her miracle. And whenever you're on your way to a miracle, you are going to have interruptions. And you're going to have opposition. And you're going to have adversity. But you've got to continue on. You've got to keep saying what God's word says. You've got to keep hearing God's word and saying God's word and reaching out and touching his garment in worship and praise because he said if just two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in the midst of you. Amen? And you will know when Jesus has come into your presence. I know sometimes in the morning... When I start off in my morning prayer and I'm walking around my house and I'm praying, you know, and I'm praying and I'm praying for a good while and it's, it's good, it's good. Prayer is, praying is good. It's all good. But all of a sudden, the atmosphere changes. I don't know exactly when it changed. I can't tell you that it was anything specific that I said or did. I'm just walking around praying like I always pray. But the atmosphere changes. And when the atmosphere changes, I know that the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon, hallelujah, has come into that garden of prayer. 
And now instead of me just walking around my dining room table, I'm singing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. Oh, the joy that we share. And then I want to tarry there. I'm usually, it's, it times up. I've already put in over an hour. It's times up. No, it's just getting good. It's just getting sweet. Oh, it's just getting good. The good part. But where we fail so many times is we don't ever press to that place. And we never find out that there's a breakthrough place there. If you ever get there once, you'll want to go back. And you'll know what you've got to do to get there. But the problem is people spend years, and I say people and I'm stepping on my own toes. People spend years and they never get that breakthrough because they stop before they get it because the flesh gets tired and the flesh gets weary and oh, I gotta, I gotta go load the dishwasher and oh, I gotta do this. But just tarry a little longer. Remember when they were on the road to Emmaus and Jesus was talking to them and they had been so discouraged they were ready to quit and Jesus talked to them and all of a sudden because faith comes by here and they didn't know it was Jesus of course but he began to tell them the word of God and he said their hearts began to burn and when they got to the place it was time for them to go in the house and Jesus was to go on and Jesus went on his way and they said oh they constrained him they said abide with us and that's what you've got to do. You've got to say, come Holy Spirit and abide. And so now she's heard, she said, she pressed, she touched, she felt, and she received. Now when she touched Jesus, according to the law, she had made him unclean. But what I like about it is, as soon as she felt something come in, he felt something go out. Amen? Because Jesus stopped. And he said, who touched me? And they said, oh, Lord, there's so many people out here, no telling, everybody's touching you. He said, no, I felt virtue. The Greek word is dunamis. I felt power. I felt the power to heal. I felt it go out of me. How many say amen? And when he felt it go out, she felt it come in. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he said, who touched my clothes? That even sounds even odder, who touched my clothes. That's even weirder than who touched me. But we got to understand it's not just clothes. It's not just clothes. She touched his authority. She touched the authority of who he is, the son of righteousness with healing in his fringes. She touched the whole word of God. She touched the authority that in the name of Jesus, you shall be made whole. He said, no, no. Who touched my clothes? They said, so many people are touching you. We don't know Jesus. They're looking at each other like they don't understand what's going on. And the Bible says the lady came fearing and trembling, fell down at his feet, and she told him all the truth. She told him all her story. Now, you know, it's speculation. You can speculate, I can speculate, we, you know, however you want to do it, I'm sure it'll be okay. Why was she fearing and trembling? Well, you know, right off the bat, we could say, well, she knew that she was wrong to touch him because after all, she shouldn't have been touching him in her unclean uh, way. And maybe she was fearing because she thought he was going to holler at her and, and he was going to scold her for touching him, the holy man of God that he was. I'll tell you what, if she touched one of them Pharisees, she sure would have heard something she wouldn't want to hear. She'd been trembling for real. If she went up there and touched one of them Pharisees fringes. Amen? Why was she fearing and trembling? Because you've got to understand, you know, the word fear doesn't just mean to fear because uh, you have, you're terrorized by someone because for, for, a, for a reason of evil. The word fear means also to have awe and respect. The word awesome, they've crucified it today. They use the word awesome, you know, if you say, you got, oh, you got new shoes, oh, wow, they're awesome. They're not awesome. It's impossible for things to be awesome. It, it cannot be. The only thing that can be awesome is God because it means to stand in absolute wonder and marvel 
at this miraculous, supernatural, omnipotent thing that you've just experienced until you're standing there like this. That is what awesome means. Amen. I mean, you can even go to the dollar store and buy stuff to clean your house called awesome. But that's not the word. Amen. She had such awe and she was trembling. Let me tell you something. Have you ever been touched by the Holy Ghost power in your body till physically you felt like you could not stand on your own two legs? They were doing this. Have you ever trembled under the power of the Holy Ghost? Have you ever felt so much? How many have raised your hand if you've ever felt that? Wow, turn around, look at all the hands. Keep your hand up and look. I can only think of one thing to say. And I don't mean to be mean, but what happened? I mean, when you have your trembling, I can remember being carried out of the church, speaking in tongues. How many say amen? And so this, she came trembling because so much power of God was upon her. And she fell down and she told him all of the things that had happened. And so Jesus said to her, he said, woman, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go and be whole of thy plague. And it's in the perfect tense in the Greek, which it means this, an action that has already occurred and is completed, but with the results now coming into the present state. When she touched him, immediately she was made whole, and she is whole, she's going forth whole, she's going to be whole tomorrow, next week she's going to be whole, next year she's going to be whole, she's going to be whole for the rest of her life. That's what the perfect tense implies here. Amen. So he said, go your way, woman, because your faith has made you whole. And so go and be healed of your plague. Now, how many know this is, we could go home from church right now and we get, we're just already blessed. This is all we need. But there's, there's somebody standing over there politely in the corner, very politely and patiently. You see, he had come and he, he exercised the first P of faith. He had petitioned Jesus earnestly. And he, he believed and he said, if you touch my little daughter, she shall live. And Jesus said, very well, let's go. But they were interrupted by this woman who needed a miracle. And here's Jairus all this time, and he is now exercising the second P of faith. He's patiently waiting. He could have said, now look, I'm pulling rank here. I'm the ruler of the synagogue. How many know a lot of people do that? A lot of people that are in ministry try to pull rank. Like I'm more important because I'm the great reverend so-and-so. But he didn't. He could have been thinking to myself, now with all due respect, lady, you have waited 12 years. What is another half an hour? I mean, what's another 30 minutes? Can't you just wait and let Jesus go pray for my daughter? She's dying. Obviously, you're very sick, but you're not dying. You have lived for 12 years with this condition. I think you can make it a few more minutes. He could have protested and said, Jesus, I was here first. And you already said you would come and pray for my daughter. But he didn't. He patiently waited. He waited and watched all that took place. He watched that lady get her miracle. How many say amen? And he didn't get upset and he didn't pitch a fit because he didn't get his when he wanted it right now. Amen? And so he stood there and he exercised patience. Amen? And he stood there politely and waited for the Lord to finish. And he could have said, now, you're making my little girl wait. It could be too late. But he waited patiently. The woman got her miracle. 
and Jesus was ready now to go on. And let's take it up where we left off. And let's see. I tell you what, even my glasses are getting anointed because they're so smoggy. I can't, they're all, they got anointing on them or something. They're like clouds. I can't see through them. All right, where did we leave off? Verse, honestly, I might need somebody to help me read here. What verse was it? 35. All right. Verse 35. So he said, go, in verse 34, he said, go be healed of thy plague. While he yet spake, and this is very important that we see how these events just uh, overlapped one another. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the words, that were spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Now let's see what happened here. He started off with the first P, he petitioned. He was patient all that time that Jesus took with that woman. Now it's finally time for his miracle to come. But while Jesus was literally speaking to the woman, talking to the woman, People came from his house and said to him, it's too late. Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the master any further? And the Bible says that when Jesus heard, now that word in the Greek is not the normal word for hear, just you heard something. It's a word that specifically means that you overhear. Or better to put it this way, have you ever been sitting in front of TV watching something you really wanted to, to get the information? Maybe it was the weather because you're going to go in tomorrow and you want to know what the weather is or the news. And you're trying to listen to the news. Meantime, one of somebody comes into you and starts asking you, so-and-so, what did you do? And you're trying to listen to the weather and listen to them too. And you're trying to understand this and listen to this. And so you manage to pick up a little bit of both. This is what happened here. Jesus is saying, woman, you go and behold. And he heard them speaking to Jairus. It's too late. Your daughter is dead. Now here is where the third P of faith comes in. He could have all of a sudden kicked into absolute despair. He could have said, why? Why didn't you come right away? And now it's too late. If this woman hadn't interrupted, she could have waited. It's not right. My little girl, my only child, my only little baby is dead. And it's too late. He could have began to, like so many of us do, right before our miracle, things start going the opposite. Things start turning around and going the opposite of what we believe. And then we begin to question God and accuse God, and why God, and get upset. This is where the third P comes in. Amen? He could have said if you'd only come, if that woman hadn't interrupted, if only that she, uh, that she you know, if I'd have gotten Jesus a few minutes sooner, if only we had gone on. How many know it doesn't do you a blessed bit of good to sit there and say, if I had done this, if I had done that, if I did this? You didn't. So guess what? Forget those things that lie behind. You can't go back. Yeah, I know hindsight's the perfect science. We can all look back and say, I should have, I could have, I wished have, I would have. I lived that way for so long and the devil kept me tormented and my faith was absolutely crippled and paralyzed. I couldn't use it because I was too busy thinking, but if I hadn't done this, if he hadn't done this to me, if she hadn't said that, if this person hadn't done that, if this hadn't happened, but it had. And here I am. So what am I going to do now? Amen? It doesn't do any good to go down that road. You'll get absolutely nowhere. But lose your faith. But he held on and he did not protest. And he did not cry out. And he did not uh, exclaim, it's not fair, it's not right. Amen? But he persevered in his faith. And Jesus as soon as he heard that those words, he immediately, right away, turned to him. Because he, Jesus understood something that we all must understand. He understood the power 
of an evil report. Never underestimate the power of an evil report. And I don't want to stay there very long, but I want to bring it out. Amen? You've got to understand. You have to realize and recognize because an evil report can cause someone's faith to just plummet. Because the scripture says, and you all know this, and if you don't have it marked, you should in your Bible, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And a man and a woman will eat the fruit thereof. Jesus knew that Isaiah 37, 6 says, Be not afraid of the words thou hast heard. Because when they brought the word to Hezekiah that King Sennacherib, he, he put in words, he went into great detail what he was going to do to Israel. He was going to basically smear them in the mud. And I have, there's not a, a, a king or a nation that I haven't gone in and absolutely wiped them out. Nobody has stood up against me. Nobody's God has ever delivered them out of my hand. That's what Sennacherib boasted. And when Hezekiah got that letter, and he read that letter, what he said, I'm going to do to you when I get there. But Isaiah, the prophet of God, came and he said, don't be afraid of the words that thou hast heard, because God is going to deliver him in your hands. Jesus knew that Psalm 112.7 says, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He knew that Proverbs 325 says, be not afraid of sudden fear. That's powerful. That's exactly what just happened here. Sudden fear that comes and grips your heart. It's like somebody's taking a dagger and, 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 or, and just hit you in your heart and all the life, all the breath just goes out of your body. How many say amen? He knew that Proverbs 133 says, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And he knew that Isaiah 53, 1 said, who hath believed the report of the Lord? How many say amen? And so Jesus knew the power of an evil report and he no sooner finished telling that lady, go thy way and behold, and he said, fear not, only believe. Now here's the thing. Jesus used the present tense. The first part was the present tense with a negative. The second part is the present tense with a positive. What does this mean? Whenever you use in the Greek a, a present tense with a negative, it is telling you to stop an action that is already in progress. Let me say that again. It means to stop doing something that you're already doing. When it says in Ephesians 4.27, give no place to the devil, that's not a good translation. It's in the present tense. It's a negative. Stop giving place to the devil. You're already doing it. Stop it. Cut it out. Quit it. So Jesus knew that that report had already brought fear to his heart. When he said, fear not, he actually said, stop fearing. Do you see that? He was commanding him to stop a negative action that was already in progress. And then he used the present tense in the positive, and he said, only believe. And it doesn't mean you believe for one second. It's the present tense. It means keep on believing and keep on believing and keep on believing. But what you've got to understand here is you cannot keep on believing until you stop doubting. You can't keep on believing until you stop fearing. You can't engage your faith in positive. You can't put it in drive if you're in reverse. Before you can go forward, you've got to get out of reverse and shift into drive. And so he says you've got to stop doubting. You've got to stop fearing. You cannot let your heart be afraid of sudden fear, but you've got to trust and keep your heart fixed, and keep on believing. Now, he was at a crossroads. He had a decision to make. He could either plummet now in fear, like, what is the point? She's dead. It's too late. 
They said, don't trouble, don't bother Jesus. There's no point in even coming to the house. Let him go pray for somebody that's still got hope. He had a choice to make. But Jesus said, this is where your faith has got to persevere. It's not just enough to be patient sometimes. You can be patient and patient, and now you're expecting the great reward. And instead, everything turns around and nose dives. That's when you've got to kick into perseverance. How many say amen? And so Jesus said, stop doubting and keep on believing. You either hear the evil report and let that crush your faith, or you hold fast to what I'm telling you. So what did Jairus do? He chose to keep on believing. How many say amen? Somebody said, well, after all, it can't get any worse. She's dead. Can't get much worse than that. You're absolutely right. It couldn't get any worse, but it could get better. Amen. If he believed, if he believed, if he didn't give in to doubt. How many say amen? And so he couldn't let fear grip his heart. He had to persevere. So he went with Jesus and they went on. Now let's see where we, where we left off. Verse 37. And he, meaning Jesus, suffered no man to follow him, saying, Save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And... He cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, which was Peter, James, and John, and entered in where the damsel was lying. Okay, let's very quickly go through what happened here. So, He's going to go now to the house. Now there's a throng and a press following them, right? Where they are, they're surrounded by people. The first thing Jesus did was get rid of the doubters. He said, hey, Peter, James, John, you three and no one else. Those three alone he took to the house. I believe all the way to Jairus' house, Jesus was saying, just keep on believing. Just keep on believing. Don't be afraid. Just keep on trusting all the way. I don't know how far away he lived. I don't know if it was one block or two blocks or however long it was, but he only let Peter, James, and John come along with him. Nobody with an evil report, no doubters, no naysayers, no, no gainsayers, but only those. And all the way he said, keep on believing. I believe that by the time they got to the house, I think that Jairus was feeling a whole lot better. I think he was feeling a whole lot better. And then when he got to the house, they're wailing and they're weeping and they're crying and they're moaning. Because you see, they hired professional mourners. It is written, I understand that even the poorest of people, even the poorest had to hire at least two mourners professional mourners to cry and moan and wail. And you know what they do? They pick up dirt and they throw it up in the air and they hit their chest and they throw dirt on their head and they make that really weird noise. How many know that noise I'm talking about that they make when they're upset? I can't even try to do it. I mean, it's not, it's even not, I'm not even talking about that, that thing they do in the Alps, that yodel over there. I'm talking about that real funny thing they do. <laughs> It means, I mean, and they, they, they were just carrying on. So what do you think happened when he got there? Have you ever been to a funeral where the really the close ones to the departed are holding up pretty well? They're doing pretty well. I mean, you know, they're, they're having a hard time, but they're holding up and they're keeping it together. And bless your heart, you get in the service and somebody who's not even that close, not even that close to the deceased, they get up, they go, ah! Ah! And they carry on so bad that they upset the, the ones that are close that were doing pretty good. <laughs> How many know I'm telling the truth? And you're thinking, what are they doing? Because they carry on like that. Well, they, they, would, they should have been living back then. They could have made a lot of money. <laughs> Amen? Because that, that, that's what they wanted. They hired people to do it. But the point I want you to see is, 
it triggers something in people. The person who was holding it up and being pretty good, all of a sudden they start cracking and breaking down and screaming and wailing. So I believe J. Iris was starting to feel pretty good until he got there. Now that we were going, oh, oh. And he had to make a choice. Was he going to give in again to emotions? Was he going to give in to fear? How many say amen? And then Jesus says, what is wrong with you people? Why are you acting like this? What are you doing all this for? She's not dead. She's only sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. That is how I know they weren't very sincere. <laughs> I mean, they went from wailing to, oh, to, to laughing him to scorn. That means they were going, oh, you believe this man. She's not dead. She's sleeping. Now, what do you think that was doing to Jairus? To see all this. This man started off with some pretty strong faith. He came saying, you come and lay hands on my daughter, she shall live. This man's faith has been drug through the mud, through all the interruptions, through all of these events. This man started off with strong faith. And it has been put to the test again and again. And Jesus said, get them all out of here. He put them all out. And this is a vital key when you're on your way to a miracle. You've got to get rid of all the doubters, all the negative people, all the naysayers. Doesn't it just kill you when you're trying to preach faith to someone and someone else is standing there and they constantly butt in and tell you all the negatives? Amen? And uh, you have to stop ministering to the one that needs faith and rebuke this person. If you can't help us, don't hinder us. Just get out. How many times have you heard the testimony of someone who had a loved one, maybe in a coma or dying in the hospital, no hope, and I mean, they were going to have to have a miracle or they weren't going to come out. And they would not let anybody come in that room unless they spoke faith. Amen. Unless they spoke faith. If they were going to come in there and wail and cry and moan and carry on, they said, don't come in. No, we don't mean to be hard-hearted. We don't mean to be mean. We're not being cruel. If your faith isn't there yet, you're not there yet. That, okay. But you cannot project that onto someone who is in desperate need for a miracle. You know, they got to go get their faith together. You can't, at this point, you've got to keep yourself surrounded. So number one, you put out all the doubters. And number two, he took in the mother, the father, and those that were with him, Peter, James, and John. So first of all, you got to get rid of the doubters and the naysayers. And then you've got to surround yourself with people who have faith because you're not strong enough in your own to do it by yourself. See, it's good to get rid of the naysayers, but if you think, well, now I've got rid of all of them, now I can do it. No, you can't. Amen. You need to be surrounded by people that reinforce your faith. Some of you are looking at me funny. I'm telling you by experiencing. I know what it is to lay in bed and wait and cry and wait and cry and finally say, you know what? I need some help around here. I need some reinforcements. Amen. I need somebody to come and pray for me. And I've had people tell me, well, Sister Sharon, when we, 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 we wanted to come, but we didn't know what to tell you. I said, you tell me the same thing I told you. Whatever I ever told you, whatever I ever preached to you, you tell it back to me. I need to hear it. Amen. I need to hear it right now. Isn't that right? And so he got rid of the naysayers and he brought only those in who would speak the word of God. So these people were in total unbelief. They were in total hysteria. They said they, were, they knew that she was dead. He put them out. He got rid of all the hystericals, all the unbelievers, and he brought only those that had faith. Now, I'm sure that by this time, 
Jairus, I mean, and can you imagine, the Bible doesn't say anything about her, but we know the mother was obviously there because Jesus brought her in the room. Can you imagine that when Jairus got to the house and saw all these people carrying on like I just described a moment ago, and what did he see? What pain did he see in his wife's face when he had to look at her? She was at the bedside when that little girl gave her last breath. She knew she was dead. That mother knew that child was dead. Amen? Yes, she did. All right, so he saw that in her faith, her face. But even then, he had to be strong. He had to stop fearing and only believe. Amen? So he took him in the room, and now we're going to get down. We have the petition. We had the patience. We had the perseverance. And now we're going to get the fourth P, which is the promise. Okay? And verse... 41, and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given to her to eat. All right, let me finish up here right now. And I want to, this has all brought us to this climax. He went in and he said, he took her by the hand and he said, Talitha Kumi. Now it says there, being interpreted, damsel arise. Now I have read in a couple Jewish interpretations, one Jewish New Testament and one by uh, uh, the, Jew, the people that have Jewish jewels that that put out all the programs on the Hebrew. And I've read at least two places where they believe that what Jesus said was not little damsel or damsel, I say unto you, arise. Because that word is very close to the word that means damsel. But what he actually said was Talitha Kumi. And he said, little damsel, arise to my prayer shawl. Because this, arise to my talit, talitha kumi. I say unto you, arise to my talit, arise to my prayer shawl. Because this was the whole word of God. This was the name of God. And this was his authority, that he was the son of righteousness with healing in his fringes. How many say amen? And so he said, little damsel, I say unto you, arise unto my talit. And just like the, the woman with the issue of blood touched the fringes and was made whole, Jesus said, little damsel, arise. I mean, you know, if it works for that little woman, why, why, if it works, keep it working. How many say amen? If you work for her, if it calls her to get her miracle, isn't that right? He said, arise unto my prayer shawl. What he was saying is arise to the authority of the whole word of God. Arise to the name of God. Arise to the authority of who I am, that I am the son of God. And there's healing in my name. How many say amen? And they were astonished with a great astonishment. Now, it's a little peculiar that it says astonished with a great astonishment because it's two Greek words. It's not the same one. The first one means amazed. It means to just be totally beside yourself. It means the word actually means to stand out. It means you're so amazed you have to stand out here and look at it because it's just more than you can take in. You just got to stand there. You're in amazement. And really, you have to look at it and contemplate what you've just seen. That's the first one. They were astonished. With great astonishment. It's a second Greek word, and we get our word ecstasy from it. And it means to remove not only out of your place physically, but it means to remove yourself out of your mind for a time. To be carried away out and beyond your mind. In other words, to say, it blew my mind. That's what it means. 
And when they saw that little girl and they saw her coming out, they knew she was dead. But when they saw her walking about, then it said it blew my mind. How many say amen? And Jesus said, give her something to eat. Because you notice when any, the first sign that somebody has been made well that's been sick is they get hungry. They want something to eat. How many say amen? And so we had the petition, the first P. We had the patience, even when we got interrupted on his way to the miracle. And we had the perseverance when then everything went absolutely, it started off to a good start and then everything started going backwards. But he persevered even in the face of disaster. And he got the promise that he started off in his petition. If you come and touch her, she shall live. How many say amen? And so I say to you tonight, if you have a need in your life, no matter what it is, you've got to make up your mind. You're not going to give up. You are not going to doubt. You're not going to lose hope. You're going to press in. How many say amen? You're going to get a hold of the word of God and you're not going to let go. And this word of God will not fail you. It is alive. Jesus said the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How many need something from God tonight? Why are you sitting there? Why are you sitting there? You should jump up and say, I do. If you need something from God. Amen. Do you need something from God tonight? Amen. Let your petition be made known tonight. Get the promises of God and stand on the word of God. Amen. And know that God's word cannot lie and cannot fail. If you need something from God tonight and you're ready, you're ready. Come on up here right now. If you're ready, come on up here right now. <laughs>